Do you want to learn the secrets when it comes to mastering cold email for B2B? Then stay tuned. I'm Sam Dunning, owner over at samdunning.org. And if you want to grab my free B2B marketing playbooks, podcasts, or whenever you're ready to work with me, head over to samdunning.org. So joining me today, I've got Jay Feldman. He is the owner over at Otter PR, and you've got to check him out on YouTube. It's Lead Gen Jay. We're going to talk about the secrets when it comes to mastering B2B cold emails. We're we'll diving into things like, does it actually work today? How does it stack up compared to other inbound, outbound, or even demand generation channels? Can cold email work for any B2B tech or service-based organization? And a bit of a step-by-step. -step. So if you're new to cold email, or if you're a seasoned pro, you'll get some useful pointers from starting from scratch right through to using it to deliver meetings for yourself or your sales team. So with that in mind, Jay Feldman, welcome to the show, sir. How are we? Doing really good. It's morning here. Great to, great to be here with you, Sam. Talking to other marketers, excited to jam on some lead generation. I'm excited to give some value to the audience. Excellent. Excited to dive in, sir. So Let's get straight into it. We don't beat around the bush here. Cold email. I hit, I've only got a flick onto LinkedIn, Jay, and I've got one person saying, person saying cold email is dead. The next person saying it's okay. And the third person saying it's alive and well and delivering meetings. It's How, how does it actually stack up kind of 2024 and moving forwards in your opinion? 2024, cold email is stronger than ever, especially with the way that AI is being integrated into cold email. Everybody is taking this for granted. Uh, but yeah, there's massive scare in the cold email community as well right now as there usually is. Uh, mm -hmm. The new scare right now is that Google and Yahoo are releasing an update in the coming months that is going to decrease the spam threshold, how many emails can be marked as spam out of a thousand to 0.3%. Uh, and that's scaring a lot of email marketers, but there's a lot of falsities to that as well. So uh, in my opinion, cold email is going strong. Uh, a lot of the fear that's out there around cold email is not actually for B2B cold email. It's for B2C cold email. Uh, and I'm sure we'll jump into that, but it's alive and well. AI is making it more powerful than ever, and it's booking more meetings for us than it ever has before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And for anyone that, that's not that aware of the uh, issues that were flagged recently with Google and Outlook, what does, that, what does that mean exactly, and how do you think that will impact cold email? So there's good cold emailers and there's bad cold emailers. We call them spammers and everybody knows what I'm talking about. So cold email, the, the power to it and why it's so popular is because it's so cheap to send emails at scale and to get email addresses to send them to. So you can wield that for good or you can wield that for evil. And if you send just shotgun approach millions of emails across, across the web to everybody who has an email address, that's a problem. That's spamming. That is not good marketing. So the updates, but the coming updates from Google are targeted to reduce that, to stop the spam on the consumer's end, on the B2C end. It is not designed to stop B2B cold email. And the reason we know that is the, out, the inboxes that have at gmail.com or at yahoo.com at the end are really going to be the ones with those protective filters. Right. I was reading something the other day, and this could be completely off base, but if like a couple people receive one of your cold emails and they go onto that email system, be it on Gmail or Outlook and flag you as spam. It only takes a few for that whole domain to kind of almost be flagged. Is that right? Or is that, is that wrong? Or where do you stand there? Oh, that's correct. Three out of a thousand, which is an abnormally small number of emails being flagged as spam. Now this is personal inboxes, not business inboxes. And this right. is only for Gmail and Yahoo so far. They've kind of fired the first shots at email marketing. Outlook so far seems to be okay uh, from what I currently understand. Now, where I think this gets really scary is for every business who uses email for marketing, sending out newsletters, sending out promotions to their active list, to people who have subscribed at one point. Because typically people will subscribe with personal emails. Yep. I think most businesses have like 30 or 40% personal emails subscribed. And those are the ones that are likely to mark you as spam and be counted as one of the three of 1,000. So it's definitely going to have to change how not just cold emailers, but anyone with a business and with a list markets to their list by email. 
Uh, and I'm happy to go through some of those the, those ways that businesses can be careful. Uh, I need to be careful in 2024. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Perhaps we can get into that in a bit as as want to keep this kind of more to cold email than yes. to guess remarketing to list. But if you've got time, happy to jump in. So quick one on how it stacks up. Appreciate cold email as more of a top of the funnel activity. So you can building that awareness for perhaps that people have never heard of you before or your brand or your company or the problem you fix. It's a very much early stage when you compare it to something perhaps like SEO or paid search or LinkedIn ads, which quite often someone already has a problem, might be solution aware. It's it's a lot different. But how would you say it stacks up to compare to when when we compare it to some of the more well known kind of marketing or outreach channels? Right. So when we're we're talking to startups, you're talking to people who are trying to generate top of funnel traffic for the first time. Top of funnel meaning people who don't know who you are. They don't know what you do. They don't know what you offer. You need to get their attention and tell them what it is that you do so that they can buy your thing. There's a few different ways to get top of funnel traffic. You, You mentioned a couple good ones right there. SEO is one, but can take years and thousands and thousands of dollars to develop and start ranking on on Google in the in a place where people are actually coming to your website. There's organic social, but again, can take years to start gaining traction, at building a following, driving traffic that way. There's paid ads. You mentioned LinkedIn. You can run Google AdWords campaigns on search. You can run Facebook, TikTok ads. All of those things cost a lot of money and have a steep learning curve. So typically, companies will, will try these things. They'll throw some money at Facebook ads, throw some money at TikTok ads, and then realize, oh, man, it's, it's not converting. I'm just pouring money into a trash can. Now, with cold email, it, this is honestly the way that I was able to launch and build my agency and get it to the point it is today, which is $10 million in, in revenue. We have 65 employees. All started with cold email because, one, you can hyper-target the exact person that you want to reach, assuming that you sell B2B. You can get one of these B2B databases like Apollo or Zoom Info and filter by the exact person that you want to reach. Get their email. Get their phone number. And then you can send them an email for almost no money. Now, yes, there's strategy to it. How do you create an email that they're actually going to open and then be intrigued enough to respond to? How do you not get filtered into their spam box or get uh, blacklisted for your entire domain? There's a lot of technical issues and strategy to overcome there. But if you do, there is no cheaper way to acquire the exact leads that you need to sell to. Mm. Yeah. All, all sounds good. I mean, in, in terms of when we when we talk about B2B email, is it something that, in your opinion, is it cost effective for all types of B2B organizations from, say, let's say a service company that maybe offers something for anywhere from a grand a month upwards compared to maybe a, I don't know, a SaaS or tech company that's maybe got a really high average contract value that's maybe kind of starting at 300 grand a year or something like that to invest in their software. Can it work wonders for both of those massively different organizations, or is there a bit of a sweet spot for where companies should consider cold email? So if we're talking about B2B companies only, whether it's software, consulting, marketing services, yes, it works for all of the above. There is a a class of business that I would say it doesn't quite apply to, and that's really low ticket B2B. So for example, if you sell me a software that costs $9 a month, or $99 a year, it might not work for you because it it does take work. It does take some money to get to scale with how many emails you need to send to be effective. But if you have anything high ticket, I'd say the minimum thresholds, $1,000 of value per client, then it will work for you. We've worked with companies ranging from selling fertilizer to farms that were successful with B2B email. B2B software, enterprise software, consulting companies, lots of marketing agencies. The messaging changes, the strategy changes, but it all works. Mm. And I want to get into that. We'll dive into a bit of a step-by-step in a minute because I've, I've got a lot, of, uh, a lot of opinions myself. So I'm sure you're much the same, Jay. You probably get tons of cold email yourself running a business, as do mm-hmm. I, LinkedIn emails. So it'd be interesting to know kind of your thoughts on how you basically stand out from 99% of the trash that's literally a wall of yes. text talking about how great the offer or how great their company is or how many years they've been in business that just sends business owners like you and me to sleep. So let's look at it from a ground zero, starting from scratch perspective. 
if a B2B tech or service company is tuning in or maybe a marketer or a founder and they're thinking, sounds good so far, but how difficult is this to set up? I mean, I've got limited experience and knowledge in, in B2B cold email. What, what are some of the first points that you should get stuck into, Jay, to make it happen? So you mentioned standing out and then talking about the technical aspects of getting started. I'll, I'll just walk through start to finish what it actually takes to build a, a successful cold email campaign. And I'm not going to lie and say that it's really easy and simple. You just go push a few buttons and you're sending cold emails directly into inbox and generating leads. It's, I would say, like any other form of marketing, nothing is easy if you want to be good at it because there are a lot of other people who are really good at it that you're competing mm -hmm. against. And you're a, you're a business owner. I'm a business owner. I get cold emailed all the time. Most of it is trash. And those are the ones that land in my inbox. The ones that land in my spam are even more trash. So whether it's SEO, whether it's Facebook ads, all of that stuff is technical. You're going to need to learn how to do it correctly if you're going to win. Now, with that being said, I learned how to do cold email within a couple of months, and that was me not having the resources that I provide. So I do think it's attainable enough for the average business owner to go figure out in a couple of weeks and then going through some trial and error to get it actually fine tuned and working just like anything else. But the steps that you need to take in order to get cold email to work is one, the setup, which can is going to be the most technical part. You need to buy secondary domains that are similar enough to your primary domain to not confuse the recipient. You need to set up email sender accounts, whether that's with Outlook or G Suite or an SMTP server. You need to warm up those email accounts using a warming tool like Instantly AI or Warmy IO. There's a lot of options available to you. Once you see that those sender accounts are not going to spam, you're actually landing in the inbox, then you can start figuring out who you're going to email which is the first non-technical part, but the strategy part. And if you mess one of these things up, the whole thing's going to break and you're going to wonder why. So all of these things need to be perfectly aligned and they need to be in working order. So working with an expert or lots of trial and error is, is, is what you're going to go through. So who you're going to email. Let's, you need... let's break down some of those, Jay, before we, we jump ahead. Um, so... Buying domains, I'm, I'm guessing that's fairly straightforward. We don't need to get too much into that. But you mentioned they should be similar to your current, your primary domain, but not the same one. Yes. So we don't want to use our primary domain for the reasons we mentioned earlier. If a lot of people mark them as spam, and they will, especially if you're new and you don't know what you're doing and you're sending bad cold emails, then your primary domain is at risk of being blacklisted. And all of your company's emails that are going to your clients and your, each other can start going to spam. We don't want that. This is a, a not, not a good place to be as a company. So for example, uh, my company, Otter PR, this is my primary marketing agency. If I'm buying secondary domains that I want to look similar enough to Otter PR, I'm going to get otterpublicrelations.com. I'm going to go and get, and get otterpubrail.com, otterpublicity.com. Uh, and some things to avoid in those secondary domains are .nets, uh, any any other dot other than com, IO is okay, AI is okay, but those can be a little more expensive. Avoid any hyphens or dashes in your domain names. Uh, so we found little things that will affect deliverability. Try and keep them to simple two or three words and similar enough to your primary domain. Nice. And then in terms of kind of this initial technical setup, what kind of pricing, like how much does that cost and then perhaps we can dive into a bit more about how warming up domains works, sure. just so founders that are perhaps bootstrapped can understand kind of what's involved. And I think my son just walked in the room, so you might have heard that if you're tuning in, he's just left now. So initial costs for getting started with cold email, buying a domain, 12 bucks. Setting up the DNS records on a domain, this is the technical aspect. You need a DKIM, you need SPF records, you need a DMARC record. Uh, that stuff's easily available online if you want to go Google how to set these things up. It's relatively straightforward. That's all free. Then you need to, a place to send these emails from. Uh, and this is like a sender email account, whether you use G Suite or Outlook. If you set it all up on GoDaddy, you can get the email address for $2 per month. So now you're at 12 bucks for the domain, $2 per month for an Outlook sender email. And then you need a sending software like Instantly AI. This I think you can get for 34 bucks a month. So we're still well under $100, and now we can send cold emails. Decent. So it's not going to break the bank. And 
in terms of that that warm-up flow, is that difficult or should we just, apologies if you break it down just then, but is that something that you can kind of set up with a third-party tool? Is that something you need to set up yourself? As The reason I ask is I'm curious as well, is it's cold emails, not something we have an agency have, have dived into massively. So as well as some of the audience, I'm, I'm learning as well. Of course. Um, so now a lot of the tools are integrated. They make it as easy as possible. So for example, Outlook. Say you're using Instantly AI, which is the platform that I use. I'm one of their official partners. You'll log into your Outlook email right there on instantly.ai. And the sending and the warming are all integrated. So it's as easy as clicking a button to getting warm up started. And the way warm up works is it will exchange emails with other uh, inboxes within their ecosystem. And if those emails start to go to spam or start to become unimportant, those inboxes in their ecosystem will remove them from spam, will mark them as important. And this trains the email servers that this email sender is sending good emails. Uh, you do that for long enough and you keep that running and the chances of your emails going to spam become lower and lower. And this also monitors the health of your inbox so that if they do start going to spam, now you know about it. Got it, makes sense. All right, so that, that's the technical side of things for around 100 bucks or so. And then we want to choose who it is we're actually wanting to, to reach out to. So I'm guessing that's very nuanced depending on your offer, your service, who your target market is. If you're going after the CEO, if you're going after VP of marketing, who's relevant, I guess, that makes the decisions around what you provide. You're absolutely right. Uh, it, it is nuanced, but there's a lot of similarities that will apply to most people. Uh, you're going to want a good B2B database. And this can be probably the most expensive part of sending cold emails is spending money on the data. These companies like Apollo IO or Zoom Info spend a lot of money keeping their databases clean. You want to have emails that are valid. If you start sending emails to invalid or old emails, they bounce and now your mailbox is at risk. So spend the money on the data. We use Apollo IO. And then you'll simply figure out who your target demographic is. We typically like to email decision makers. Uh, we don't have a lot of success emailing you know, lower downs unless we're reaching out to Fortune 500 companies and we're just trying to get the email sent to the right place. So we typically go after decision makers. We typically won't go after gigantic companies because they're obviously less likely to open the email and, and need the email and reaching out to a CEO at a thousand person company via cold email is much more difficult to do. Uh, so those are the filters we typically use. You'll filter by industries that you sell to. If you sell a software product, you can filter by technologies that they're using. And a lot of these databases now also have buying intent. So they actually know what these people are searching for and what they're looking for, which is very, very cool. Gotcha. Okay. And I mean, that sounds reasonably straightforward, kind of working out who you want to sell to, not going to, to too big an organization, probably starting from the top down. And I'm guessing if you're emailing kind of CEOs, founders that aren't in huge corporation, co huge corporations, if what you're sending resonates, then even if it's not relevant to them, they might intro you a bit lower down, whether that's the marketing lead or marketing director or whoever's right. the good fit for what the offer is providing. Okay. So we've, we've got that all set up and rolling. What, what do we do next? Do we send out emails? Do we, do we work on our message? Do we work on our copywriting? Or what, what's the next stage? The next is by far the most strategic. And this is where if you're going to get consulting, do it. And this is where people go wrong. And that's what, you, what do you actually say to these people when you're approaching them for the first time? So as if you're knocking on their door with a pitch. Most of the time, you're going to get the door slammed in your face because they're not interested. You're not sparking their interest. So you've got essentially one chance to get them to open the email. That chance is in the subject line and the first line of that email because that's all you see in the preview. So you have to get really strategic as to not give too much away in that little preview, but also to, to spark their interest. You want them to open the email and you want it to be relevant enough to what you say in the email without getting the door slammed in your face. Uh, so there's a lot of examples of that depending on what message that you're saying. But my what, what I preach in cold email and in that first email is just give value. And the more value that you're able to give in that first email that's relevant to the person you're sending it to, now you've built some rapport. Now maybe they'll book a meeting. Maybe the second or third time that you email them, they, they will book a meeting. They will reply.
So I spend a lot of money on lead magnets for our company, and I'll typically lead my cold email sequence with a very powerful lead magnet. Gotcha. So let's take one step back in terms of, because like you said, probably the most important thing is actually getting your email opened in a sea of spammy cold emails, terrible outreach, and where most of us are almost tone deaf and they think, oh, for God's sake, another cold email straight to delete or archive or whatever you go to. What are some tips to, that you found effective to actually pique people's interest? And I don't know if you've got a framework or a formula for that subject line. And like you say, if you're on, on your mobile, you're only going to see a small snapshot of that subject line and then maybe one line of, of text underneath just on your small mobile screen. Right. So um, any frameworks or tips, best practices, best practices for actually getting those emails opened? So best practices 2024 is to use personalization. Now there's been a lot of spammy, obvious personalization that people use, like inserting a company name or a city or an industry into the email. Everybody knows what that is. But now in 2024 with AI tools, we can really simply run formulas on the company's information that we have to generate just personalized words. Uh, I like to use their competitor name. So for example, research Sam Dunning and come up with a single competitor for Sam Dunning that he probably knows the name of. And now I can reference that competitor in the subject line or in the first line of that email. If mm. it's a name that's familiar and relevant to you, the chances of you opening that email are up 90% because you think I actually took the time to write that email. Now there's bad AI too. Yeah, you know, Sam, I saw you went to University of Louisiana, Louisiana. You know, go go mascot name. That's bad AI. Everybody knows what that is. You want to get creative and you want to be relevant. Uh, so that would be my framework: is use, I call it elegant AI. One word, maybe two words that are relevant to that person. Competitors but, typically work pretty well. And I'm guessing there's tools like you mentioned AI tools that can help us with that. I.e., we can put in maybe we've made our target list of company decision makers and their businesses and we can feed that into a tool and then they can perhaps list out a top competitor that then goes into that subject line is that is that right yeah there's tools that can do it make that make it really easy for you instantly ai again the all it's an all-in-one sending platform they've got a little brain button right in their campaign leads you can click and run a prompt on those leads i actually built a lot of those prompts myself like the competitor one so nice. you can literally just push the brain, select the prompt, and it will insert that column for you with all of the competitors. It'll run the AI prompt on, on all of those all of those leads and spit out the competitors. It's it's pretty incredible and very easy. Any others? Like the competitors is of course nice because that's going to be top of mind. And I think that would pique my curiosity if I saw one of my top competitors there. I'd think, yeah, what the heck's that? I'm gonna click through. Any any other kind of ideas like that that people aren't going to be tone deaf to that that's maybe worked effectively for you when it comes to getting those emails opened. Yeah. And one of the things that I use when I'm reaching out to podcasts uh, to get myself scheduled on podcasts is I will upload the list of podcasts and I'll, I'll run a prompt, come up with a title of a podcast based on what I do and what they like to talk about on their podcast. And it will create a title and it will insert that into the first sentence of that email. So in terms of framework, I'd say my framework is to use elegant AI, run one of these prompts to come up with a sentence or a word that's unique, but get creative. Mm -hmm. The more creative you are, the better this will work for you. Back in the day, cold email, the, the, the subject line that was working, the best subject line in the world was question Sam or question Jay, right in the subject line. And it worked. People would open it at like a 70 or 80% open rate. Uh, we have a in our human nature we want to answer questions we want to know want to respond to questions so if we asked a question a simple question in the subject line the spark curiosity it would get opened nowadays anything i teach uh, like the competitor thing is something that i teach within my course i fear that within a month it no longer works because everybody mm -hmm. will know what it is so my call to action and my framework is to think about how you can use ai creatively based on who you're reaching out to, like the podcast host thing. If you're reaching out to YouTubers, maybe come up with a, their top competitor YouTuber or a YouTuber that they might admire or that's right under them because they're probably familiar with that YouTuber. So think about how you can use AI creatively. It's almost like a pattern interrupt, right? 
So yeah, it's, absolutely. It's trying to think of something that everyone else isn't doing, but you know is going to spark some kind of interest, like you said there, with whether that's a top competitor, whether that is something relevant to to them right now, but not something generic and obvious. Cool. Right. So and that that's how to get attention. Once you've gotten their attention, you need to convert them. Uh, so my framework for the first email is spend a lot of time and money on a lead magnet, give them the lead magnet, and hope it's relevant to who you're emailing. If you do that and they find value in the lead magnet, you're in. And when we say, how, how are we positioning that just so we can visualize or imagine it? Are we saying like, hey, whatever the name is, here's something I made for you, or is it a bit more in depth, or how does that look, usually look like? Uh, so it'll depend a little bit on who you're emailing. So for example, if I'm emailing a podcaster, uh, I might say, I made this video for you about how I booked X, X, Y, and Z name on my podcast, big names. Maybe it's Ed Milet, Gary V. Um, here's the exact framework sequence that I use to book them on my show. Uh, here it is for free. You can download it. Uh, you don't even need to go to an opt-in page. Just give it to them because you're going to go asking for a meeting on the second or third email. So that the lead magnet has to be highly tailored to who you're giving it to. When I'm trying to generate leads for my lead generation agency, Otter Leads AI, I'll typically offer them my, uh, 8 million emails that they can start with or a free lead generation course that I've developed. And if they're interested in using cold outbound lead generation, then chances are they're going to take that lead magnet, like it. And when I go asking them for a meeting on the second or third email, they're much more likely to book that meeting because I've given them some value in the first in the first email. Got it. So basically giving away something that we think is useful to them up front. And Correct. I'm guessing that could range quite a bit, right? From like you say, a, a video, maybe a playbook, maybe something else that's, I guess, tailored and you know has got insights, tips, ideas, how-tos that's kind of personalized to that to that company or what's going to help them make some kind of progress in their business. Yeah, and the, the range of value that you can offer on a lead magnet is so wide. Mm. For example, ebooks. No one's going to read your ebook. Um, I don't think most people find value in ebooks. Uh, so I would put that like the bottom of the totem pole, right next to like, here's a video to watch. Because you're asking them to consume a lot of time, and you're probably not teaching them anything new. Versus some of the lead magnets that we offer in our PR agency, like I'd like to interview you on a podcast. We literally built and developed a podcast called Scaling Secrets that's hosted by three people that we employ and we pay $100 per interview to. Uh, to interview, this is the only way that we're able to get CEOs and decision makers at 100 plus employee companies onto a sales call is we start by interviewing them on a podcast. This actually works really well, but they get a lot of value because we produce it professionally. Uh, we post it on all our social media platforms. It costs us a lot of money to offer that lead magnet. Uh, mm. So that would be an example of a really high value lead magnet. Got it. What about a company that's perhaps on the other end of the scale that's maybe just starting out? Any recommendations, perhaps founders that are a little more strapped with cash? Yeah, I'd say you can start at the, at the worst lead magnet is still better than a cold pitch. So okay. if you could offer a, a free course, maybe it's five to 10 videos that you've created. This is a really cheap, efficient way to offer like a mid-tier lead magnet. And you can host a course basically for free now using something like Go High Level or one of these uh, low low cost course builders. You can go on AppSumo and find one. Yeah. Uh, so much better than a video, much better than an ebook. Will cost you almost nothing. I would start with course. Got it. All right. That's email one. How many emails are we sending? And what, what comes up next? I'll typically cap it at five, and it'll depend how many lead magnets I have. So email one, value, lead magnet. Email two, I'll ask them for a call. It'll be a bump. It'll be in the same email thread as that first email. If they still don't book a call, they still don't respond, then email three, more value. I'll feed them my second lead magnet. Then email four and five, also a bump, trying to get the meeting. If you only have one lead magnet, cap it at three. You don't want to keep emailing somebody, hey, do you want to book a meeting? So you have, still haven't replied or scheduled a meeting. Let's, let's get that meeting. And then again and again, because eventually they're going to mark you as spam or unsubscribe. If you can't keep offering value, I would cap your sequence at three emails. Got it. 
Okay, so take into account, I guess, how much free shit that's actually valuable that you can send these prospects. Yes. And if and you've then... got a ton of awesome free shit, then keep going. I mean, if you can give them nine awesome lead magnets or pieces of value in a row, then keep it coming until they reply or book a meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, but make sure that you don't keep emailing them after they unsubscribe or after they reply, because then you can get yourself into some trouble. Yeah, yeah. And of course, this is going to be rough, but what's the following this format that we've just been talking about? What's the rough kind of open rate? Say we sent a thousand, and perhaps we should have talked about how many we should be sending a day. So maybe you can mention that in a sec. Um, what's the rough kind of open rate and then end meeting rate from your experience? So the open rate that you should aim for, and what most good called emailers get, are around 60 to 80% opens. If you're under 40%, your emails are likely going to spam or there's something wrong with them. So they can end up in your inbox, but they can have a big yellow flag when people open it that this looks suspicious. And you'll never know unless you see those low open rates. So work with your subject lines and your first lines. Work with your targeting. Uh, if you're emailing only people, you know, CEOs at 2,000 plus companies, you're going to have bad open rates. So there's a lot of things that can fluctuate that open rate, but you should aim for around 60 to 80%. Now, if you're going for, a and then you have to decide whether you're going to go for a reply or go for a click. Uh, so if you're including a lot of links in your emails, you might not track your reply rate so much. You just want people to click and open your link. Uh, so make sure you're tracking your, your link clicks and replies, but those should be somewhere between two and 10% based on how much value you're offering and at what point in the sequence are they. Got it. And as a starting point, when it comes to, because I can imagine this could be quite daunting for people that have never done this before. Once they've perhaps done the technical things we've talked about initially, got their domains, made sure they're similar to their main domain, but not the primary domain, set up several email accounts, warmed them all up, making sure they're landing in their inbox, um, kind of worked out who they're targeting, who those decision makers are, who those dream client companies are started crafting subject lines to get those opens, put together their messages, put together their lead magnets. But then what what should we what is a sensible amount that's achievable when it comes to kind of working out a daily send rate and setting yourself realistic goals? That's a good question because even the best cold emailer, I mean it still depends on volume. You need to have enough volume to make it work, to make it financially make sense. So we send about a hundred thousand cold emails per day. When you're just starting out, I always say start with a thousand. Look at your look at your stats, look at your open rates, look at your reply rates, and then scale up from there. A good company running a cold email machine should do about ten thousand emails per day. So you have to have a big enough lead pool to be able to do that as well. But ten thousand a day should give you at least one to three meetings per day, uh, which will keep your sales team relatively busy and will be a good income source for your business. And is that realistic though for someone that's just into it? Like if we're, if we're perhaps talking smaller scale, and I am grilling you a bit here, Jay, but um, if it was me, I'd imagine 10,000 sounds, sounds a fair bit as a, as a point A, maybe six months down the line when I'm kind of really used to the system or perhaps my team are. Is there, is there a smaller step that we could take before that? Yeah, I'd say start with 1,000 a day. 1,000 a day is... I think 20 email addresses, which okay. really isn't absurd. Uh, that's a couple hundred bucks a month in cost. Uh, you'll have to have access to some data. Uh, that's like a good realistic starting point. And you'll have meetings generated from that. It should generate you sales every, every week or every month. Uh, and nice. you can scale up from there. It's very easy to scale up. And it, it does sound intimidating when we break it all down. But if we were to talk about SEO, if we were to talk about ads and all the things involved in doing that too, you need a pixel, you need to set up conversion events, you need to go through and make sure your ROAS and your and the numbers all make sense. Like it's any any form of marketing that you want to be good at and want to do properly does take some work and is technical. Cold email is powerful because you can hit exactly the right person. There's nothing else you can do to hit exactly the right person. And you can scale it relatively affordably. I mean, you can get 10,000 emails per day out for about a thousand bucks a month. I mean, that's a lot of impressions. It's interesting. This is going off a tangent a bit, but before we wrap things up, I'm seeing a lot of folks on LinkedIn because I follow a lot of in the B2B marketing and sales space. And a lot of guys are saying like, 
they're not even getting sales reps to do B2B cold email anymore. They're getting someone in-house that's purely technical. So B2B sales don't even touch the email at all. They focus on making dials, cold dials, maybe nurturing inbound leads, LinkedIn outreach, whatever's relevant to their job role. They have someone in-house that's purely technical cold email. They manage the whole cycle. So the reps don't even get their hands on it and they just simply feed them the leads when they come in. Do you think that's the way things are going? That's exactly the way that we do it at our company. I should. I don't think the reps should have any any hand in the cold email. Uh, I think it's a waste of their time because you can automate the entire thing very, very effectively, especially with AI. You want to personalize the emails with sentences uh, based on that person? Run an AI prompt. There's no reason for human beings that are that you're paying to do sales and closing should be in there emailing people or even cold calling people for that matter. Uh, we strictly do the, we do the exact same thing. We run it autonomously and we, f we pack our sales team with calls using this method. Sounds like a dream for a sales rep. <laughs> yeah, I think they're very happy working at our company. I, I honestly, I can't imagine sales reps, you know, cold calling and cold emailing like one by one all day. That sounds monotonous. It sounds tedious I, to my call to action to those people is learn how to set these things up for your company. You can, keep your own calendar, you know, packed on autopilot so you can spend more time closing on the phone. Got it. And with that in mind, we've covered a fair bit. Is there anything that we should avoid or any, any kind of big mistakes that you'll often seeing where people are doing cold emails that we perhaps haven't covered at all? Yeah. Uh, and this, this will vary by country. Actually, EU is a little bit stricter, but there's laws in place to protect from spam. And you can get in pretty big trouble financially uh, for breaking these laws. So the Can Spam Act is the one that applies most to us in America. I think it applies in the EU as well. But there's certain things that you need to include in all of your cold emails to protect yourself from large fines. So this is probably the biggest mistake, and I'm glad you brought this up. Can Spam Act. So certain things that you need to have in all of your cold emails. One, you can't. It needs to be clear that it's a marketing message. You can't say. You know, I, I've got your mom, she's she's locked in a room or the, it, it's on fire, open this cold email. Obviously, you'll get that email open, but now you're breaking the law. Good open rate, but risky. <laughs> great open rate, probably not great, not a great conversion rate. And th that'll get you in some trouble. Uh, you need to have a, an op a way to opt out of your cold emails and you need to respect that opt out rate. Now, in 2024, with these updates, saying reply, stop to opt out is no longer good enough. You need to have a one click opt out on all of your cold emails. And every email sender will have a, an easy way to do this, some even mandate it, uh, to add that one-click unsubscribe link. Uh, the other thing that you need to have in your cold emails that a lot of people don't do, uh, this is massively overlooked, and we actually had a big scare for not doing this, and that's including a business mailing address in all of your cold emails. So you need to have some kind of mailing address at the bottom of your cold emails. We actually emailed a lawyer one time and her job was prosecuting cold emailers. Wow. And we did not have an address in the footer of our cold email. And she Ouch. sent an email reporting us to our domain host, to the governing body that, that I guess prosecutes for this. And I freaked out. I was talking to my, my co-founder, like, we need a lawyer up. We're going to get in some trouble. Nothing came out of it. But after that, you better believe every single email that we <laughs> sent out had an address at the bottom. Yeah. So follow a few simple rules and, and you're good. Nice one, man. Look, Jay, really appreciate you coming on. Thanks very much for sharing with myself, the audience, a breakdown of making cold email work from a B2B setting. Appreciate your time, sir. So with that, I want to thank you once again, but please do tell everyone tuning in more about how they can learn from you, connect with you, and if they want to get in touch. Sounds good. And thank you for having me, Sam. This was a blast. If you're listening and you want to learn more about cold email, uh, I'll, I'll put a link at my website, leadgenj.com. You can go backslash Sam and you'll be able to get my free course and the 8 million leads to start cold emailing. If you don't have much money, you can start there and follow me on, on YouTube. It's leadgenj. You can hit me up on Instagram, leadgenj. Let me know that you found me here and we'll hook you up with some cool stuff. Uh, and thanks again, Sam. This was uh, an absolute blast. I hope I did a good job providing some value and you seemed curious. So that's a good sign. Yeah, man. Go on, go on know those ins and outs. Like I say, we've, we've not done a cold email. It's one of the main channels we haven't done for our own agency. 
So I'm I'm generally curious, as I'm, I'm sure the audience have been too. So appreciate you sharing your wisdom. Um, we'll put all of those links below in the show notes on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, etc. As always, if you enjoyed today's episode, a quick rating or review on whenever you're tuning in or subscribe goes a long way. And if you want to catch more free playbooks, podcasts, resources, head over to samdunning.org. And we shall catch you on the next one for more No BS B2B marketing tips to grow your revenue and grow your business. Appreciate you all tuning in.